good morning, good afternoon and good evening. And welcome to the sixth episode of Discover Hospitality, a series where we discover hidden jobs and careers in the hospitality industry and share career advice with students, graduates, and those of us with a few years of experience and anyone else in the hospitality industry. I am your host, Maria Malania, a hospitality graduate, a guest experience and hospitality brand specialist, and the founder of Savvy Hotelier a place for hospitality students to ask questions and find resources for their studies and beyond. Discover Hospitality series dives into many areas of the industry, such as events, travel, wine, entrepreneurship, hotels, restaurants, and more, to really show what is possible for each and every one of us in this wonderful industry. Make sure you follow WHTT and Savvy Hotelier. Do not miss the upcoming themed events every Thursday, live here on LinkedIn, WHTT. Today's event is all about food and beverage careers. And with me today, I have four amazing panelists to help us discover what is possible within F&B. We're talking about ghost fa both guest facing service jobs and back in the kitchen as well. We'll share with you real life practical examples of the many different types of ways you can pursue what you love, whether you want to change your lifestyle or just build a really strong career whether you are, um, whatever you are in your career stage, you're going to be inspired by these panelists and their stories. So please ask your questions anytime throughout the, the panel, put them in the comment section and we will make sure to address them. We want you to get the most out of this conversation. So without further ado, let's meet the panel. Starting with Jane Spreadborough. Jane always knew she wanted to be a chef. So even though it wasn't a popular choice at the time, she, pursued it all the way. She worked her way up managing several hotels as an executive chef and then got the opportunity to move to a more corporate role. Jane now runs her own menu design and consulting business. It's great to have you, Jane. Hi, Maria. Good to be here. Um, then we have Angela Vasallo, currently F&B director at the Fairmont in Barcelona. Uh, Angela did not start his career in F&B, but rather saw an opportunity once to help and improve the performance of the restaurant in his hotel. And he has never looked back since. It's an amazing story and look forward to hearing it. Hi, Maria. Thank you for having me here. And then we have Victoria East, um, a food researcher and sustainability consultant in the hospitality industry. Um, when training to be a chef, unlike others, she didn't want to open her own restaurant, so she went on to find her own thing. She experimented and realized she could open restaurants for other people. Um, now she combines her food skills and experience and sustainability interests professionally. Look forward to hearing all about that, Victoria. Thanks so much for having me. Happy to help. And our final panelist is Jordan Kizuk. Jordan started in hospitality to supplement his income as an actor, but he fell in love with all things food and drink and have since had a brilliant career in the sector. Jordan is now head of restaurants and bars at Eden, where he curates the food and beverage offering at the properties. So, thank you. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to the conversation. Amazing. Um, I want to start with by thanking all of you so much for agreeing to join this panel, to volunteer your time and share your stories and give advice to um, hospitality industry professionals who maybe are feeling a bit lost or curious of what they can do next in their careers or maybe don't know where to begin. So I want to I love starting these conversations by asking you to share your stories because I feel like this is the best way to connect with a person on the screen as we all, all are. Um, so let's start with Jordan. You were an actor when you started working in food and beverage. Can you tell us more about when you decided you wanted to turn your job in F&B into a career? And maybe what was the turning point of, okay, I've had a great career in F&B operations. I want to move into a different office kind of role. Yeah, I think like so many actors, um, F&B was, was a really viable way to, to supplement income, right? I think a, a lot of people that I was working with when I was living in London, uh, working as a waiter on the floor, there was, there was a number of actors that, that, that had that path. Um, and, and I think F&B and restaurants and bars really just was, was, a, was an avenue of job security for me, right? It was, it was you know, a, a way to get out of a fairly poorly paid uh, job as an actor and, and have a bit of job security. Um, but I, I did really enjoy the interaction and, and, and you know, the, the hospitality career definitely was not something I, I, I decided on initially. 
but but once that once I did get into it, it was definitely something where I could see a future. And and I think you know starting in operations and then going more to the corporate side was a really organic progression. Um, I think the the hours did <laughs> did eventually get to be a, a bit of an issue for me. And then when there was an avenue to to, to get out of that to sort of do something that was a bit more routine in terms of the hours was appealing to me. Um, but but yeah, the, the opportunities to go corporate side was was something that I was looking for when I when I started in that path. Yeah, that's, that's good to hear. And um, Jane, you always wanted to be a chef. There really were no other options. Um, so how, do you, when you started out, did you see yourself doing other things to pursue corporate roles or even starting your own business? No, def definitely not. Um, you're absolutely right. In the early 90s, it was a very um, unpopular choice to want to be a chef. It was not, a, not the, the trendy and popular role that it is now. Um, so it was it was a bit of a you know a brave move, but it was all I wanted to do. Um, and I, I certainly wasn't even aware of any you know corporate roles or uh, group roles. I just was in a hotel, 15 years, working my way up from the bottom. Um, and you know again, it was just a natural progression. Um, I was looking at for an exec. I was exec chef for four or five years. I was looking for another role, um, and then a group role came up that was actually involved running a, a, a catering in a corporate office as well. So that was a bit like um, a catering, sort of contract catering um, business and running development for hotels. So I thought, you know, it's great. I'll still have a team of people. I still have a kitchen to run, um, but I can move slowly into the development side, which is which is what I did. Um, but I certainly wasn't aware of these roles at the beginning. Um, and then, you know, after I did that for about seven years and then an opportunity came up for me to be able to actually open my own business and to carry on doing all of those bits that I loved. But for doing it for obviously more hotels uh, and, you know, to be able to widen the scope. Yeah, so, so far, we've got opportunity came up for both of you just um, at the right time and the right place. Right. Yeah. Um, okay, um, Victoria, um, you've had a few careers already and you're pursuing one where you're combining your backgrounds and skills and sustainability interests into something um, new or something separate. Um, can you take a step back and tell us how did you choose to become a chef to begin with and what did you imagine your future career to be when you did that? Yeah, I actually started off in my career in um, sustainable transportation on the operations side, and um, which was a daytime job mostly. And I kind of always had catering jobs or serving jobs, um, kind of like Jordan said, to supplement my income. And um, after about, I would say five or six years in sustainable transportation, uh, I was laid off um, and really had some time to think about what I wanted to do and thought, gosh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this full time. So I'd really enjoy being in the kitchen versus the front of the house. So I went to culinary school and kind of started over. Um, and as you mentioned, I was probably the only one in my, in my class that didn't say the goal was to just open my own restaurant. I, from the beginning thought it was a very dangerous prospect of having a perishable inventory and I had kind of heard already that it takes your whole life and all of your time. And, and so I was kind of immediately thinking about different avenues for that. And in terms of private chefing or catering, um, research and development in food. Um, so I kind of made that transition and went a traditional route. I was, you know, cooking started kind of at the bottom as a prep cook and did the sandwich cook and the grill cook and, um, you know, did fine dining and hotels and just kind of, you know, did what I was told that you're supposed to do and, and gained as much experience as possible and uh, moved into executive chef roles and um, kind of did that for a while before uh, moving into, into corporate dining. And it wasn't until kind of, you know, probably 10, 15 years into doing it that that I was approached by a, a corporation, by a management company, and they wanted me to come in and, and open up some facilities. And that's when I really understood that this could be done with other people's money, that you didn't have to mortgage your house to open your own bistro. And that wasn't the only way that you could actually have 
creative license and menu development and have your own ideas for um, for either large scale production um, in catering or in direct to customer facing food service. Um, and that was really fantastic. I did that for quite a few years and, and really loved it. And like Jordan mentioned, um, it was the opportunity to really get out of the the hours that a traditional chef or food and beverage manager kind of gets stuck with, with the weekends and every holiday and Christmas. And I think it's kind of important for people to know now in the beginning of your career to look forward at what kind of you know lifestyle or life balance you might be looking for. It's it's been very difficult, I think, for people to talk about having a family or to be properly present for your family in the, the food industry as a chef. And going into corporate dining or looking at what those schedules look like in the beginning might set you up a little bit more for success later on. Mm. Yeah, there's a there's a whole lot of different interesting points there. We'll address a little bit later on. But yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, and Angelo, um, you didn't start in F&B, you fell into F&B, you were in front office to begin with. Uh, but once you discovered that, once you took that role and opportunity to turn around the restaurant, you really made a successful career out of it in F&B. Could you tell us how, how did you create that role? What made you successful and um, to get you to where you are now, you know, managing a, I would say, giant hotel in Barcelona <laughs> with a huge team? Totally right, you're totally right. So uh, actually I started uh, in a uh, room division. I was at uh, the front office. Uh, I had as well a short experience in uh, conference and event, but I was uh, mainly a uh, room division man, no? And uh, I was uh, at the front desk and in guest relation. And uh, as I was working for the Hilton in, uh, in Cologne, um, we had uh, some issue with the restaurant. So in terms of quality and financial results, and uh, I had a pretty good relationship with uh, our operation manager. So uh, I asked him to, to trust me, to, to let me run the, the restaurant, even if I have to say that uh, my experience at the time in FMB was not really so extensive, but I was willing to do it because it was for me a career step to get a deeper knowledge in operation, to grow up as a, afterwards as director of operation. So uh, it was a good opportunity. I, they gave me the opportunity and uh, we did a great, a great work with the team to have a really nice uh, financial and uh, quality result. And of course, in uh, a corporation like Hilton, when you deliver a great result, you get the attention from the corporate office and they started to move me from hotel to hotel. So from Cologne, I was then promoted to FMB manager in, uh, in Dusseldorf, where uh, um, the hotel is more concentrated in uh, focused in uh, let's say a banquet business and from Dusseldorf then I was moved as well as FMB operation manager in uh, Vienna. It, uh, the hotel there is a lifestyle hotel so more for uh, fine dining, a nice cocktail bar and uh, then uh, I moved to, to, to Barcelona where I'm currently now. As you say it is a huge property. I would say that it's not just an hotel, it's uh, like a um, different part of business because uh, we have an hotel with uh, more than 20 meeting rooms, but we have as well a Congress center. We have uh, uh, huge gardens where we do social events like uh, like wedding. We do have as well uh, external catering. Uh, we are uh, the official catering of the Formula One and the, and the MotoGP. So it's a really a complete yeah. challenge. And you know, you cannot get bored over here because actually every day is different. So, and every day you can develop new product, develop new restaurant concepts, develop new team and, and new skills. So really enjoying it. Yeah, and, and um, the reason why I invited the four of you is because you have such different backgrounds and experiences and perspectives. We've got, um, you know, menu development, opening new restaurants, you know, fixing new restaurants, making them work. Um, we also have uh, curating. That's what you do, Jordan, which is different from development, which you can address later on, um, you know, developing new concepts. And there's different kinds of roles you can do. You can do in every, you can be an effort in everyday sort of management, opening, fixing, closing, all kinds of things. And you can do uh, lots of stuff on the side. So it's just to begin open up the perspective of what is possible um, for pretty much anyone here or um, in the audience or anyone in the industry who kind of looking for their next steps and what they can do. Um, so let's, um, let's take a look at the, the challenges that 
you would you face when you start in the industry. So Jane, obviously um, it was an unpopular choice for you at the time, but also for many people. What were some of the biggest challenges that you faced when you were a young chef that you had to overcome that kind of made you successful? Yeah, yeah. well, you know, there's lots of, lots of challenges that, you know, young chefs face and I guess they're still around um, um, today, but I, I actually think I was quite lucky um, in the fact that I, I didn't have too many challenges when I first started out. And I, I really put that down to the fact that I went to um, a really good college. I studied at Westminster College um, and it was really installed in us at that point um, what, are, you know, what good working practices are. Um, so I, I left college fully prepared for, you know, long hours, having to be there on time. Um, you know, I'll always remember at college if if you were if you were on the donuts that day, you had to make sure the donuts were on sale at, at, on time. Um, at, you know, and that's that stuck with me for all these years. Um, I think I also, when I first started out in hotels, um, I always took the time. I went for lots of interviews, and I found the kitchens that I was really comfortable working in, and I ended up working with some really great teams. Um, and some people that I've worked with are still my friends today. Um, the, the biggest challenge, I think, really, is the long, hard hours. Um, you know, I was living outside of London, working in London, first train in in the morning, quite often running to catch the last train home at night. Um, you know, in the days of split shifts, well, you know, where do you go on a split shift? Well, you know, there isn't really anywhere to go. Um, so they, they were the challenges, really. But, you know, the one thing I would say is that it never. It, yes, it was hard. But did it ever really feel like a challenge? Well, no, because I was doing what I wanted to do. And I was in an industry that I loved. And I've always wondered how people are, you know, chefs or even in the food industry if they don't love it, because I think you have to, you know, to, and then you're just loving what you do. Yeah, I think certainly makes a good point. You, if you don't love the job that you do, probably 14 hours a day, um, you, you, you're you going to find something else. And um, uh, I guess, Jordan, I would like to ask you to comment on that. I guess you, you found the love, but you're again, you still wanted something else. You wanted more different hours, more sociable hours. Yeah, I, I guess every, I guess everyone's talking about the hours here. And I think we want to we want to be at, we have we want to def defend that a little bit. I think uh, it's, it's definitely a, a rite of passage, isn't it, really, sort of to, 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 to work on the floor and work those hours. Um, but I, I think uh, I was again, Jane mentioned she was quite lucky. I think I was quite lucky as well. I think there was there was an opportunity for me to to second into a, a PR and marketing role uh, within the hotel that I was working at a, 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 as a restaurant manager, and so I took a, a slight step down to go into a PR and marketing exec role, which opened up, which was great experience, which I did for about eighteen months, um, but then that allowed me then to step back into a a, a, a brand management role for a, for a restaurant chain. So I was able to sort of look, look, at, look at a restaurant and bar operation more holistically then and, and, and operate it from a 360 degree angle. So doing all of the operations uh, as, well as, all of, as well as all of the PR and marketing, which really set me up well for that role. Um, and, and then from there, then I, then I you know, moved into sort of concept ideation and concept development. So, you know, much more of the, the creative side of, of, of creating restaurants and bars. Which is uh, which was which was which I think was was tapping into my theatrical uh, nature as as an actor. Yeah, there's a way to bring that in, isn't there? Yeah, for sure. I think restaurants, I think restaurants and bars that, that create emotional responses and create you know it's connections with guests are the ones that are really successful, right? If you've not got if you've not got any strong narrative uh, or strong concept, then then guests aren't going to return. So that's what I try to put into the concepts that I've worked on. Um, Angelo, um, how how does that resonate with your first experience? Was that something that you did when when you got that first restaurant to reinvent it? Well, my first experience was really interesting, but it was, it was not really reinventing the restaurant. It was reinventing the process and to get the team aboard. Um, at the end of the day, it was uh, uh, there uh, like uh, um, like to protecting them because when. Uh, your results are bad at the end of the day, you get the attention as well from everybody else. 
and they are making pressure on you. So as a leader of the team, for me, it was really important to, to protect them and to create a new, a new team together, to create a new spirit together. And uh, I have to say that uh, getting them aboard then was really easy. It's true that we developed the a different concept as well, uh, uh, especially as well for the local uh, for the local market. We did a nice uh, uh, fish buffet. We did uh, a late breakfast for the local market as well. So we opened the the, the, the door of the restaurant as well to to the local market. And uh, FMB is funny because uh, you like um, having a lot of people around you. So you, you like to have your restaurant full of people. Uh, full of different people and maybe sometimes you enjoy as well some complaint you enjoy as well uh, some difficult guests because at the end of the day you get the experience from uh, uh from the happening that you are living in uh in your own restaurant as uh, and then it's uh, creating after creating because uh, once that you create uh, uh for example the fish buffet then uh, you you build uh, um, different experience uh, on it as well. So you may be integrating a new product, a new style of service, a new wine. Uh, maybe you invite as well your uh, supplier to uh, to explain about the wine, about uh, something that you're putting on the buffet. So it's uh, something that uh, is always challenging your creativity. And at the same time, of course, your success is, is depending on uh, how you engage your team or you motivate your, uh, your team. And I think that this one was the um, one of the biggest lessons that uh, I learned in my uh, restaurant manager position in uh, in Cologne, because uh, I realized that, of course, without your team, you cannot go you cannot go ahead. I mean, your team is the key of your uh, of your success, and uh, you are as well the one uh, that needs to promote the success of your team. Hmm. Jane, you mentioned that as well. You have to have the right team to work with, and you took the time to find the people you wanted to work with, didn't you? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's really important, you know, and, and you, the teams that you work with and the people that you meet there, that's, they, you know, it does become, you, they're your friends. Um, and I, I've still got friends from, you know, every every place that I've worked in. So um, I think that sort of, you know, it's a testament to it, to itself, really. Mm, yeah, such long hours and hard work. You have to, you have to like. Let's stop mentioning the hours. We keep mentioning the hours. Okay, okay sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> such really difficult work no i'm kidding um okay well um speaking of creativity though um victoria you you've combined various interests in your life and you've taken several different career paths and you're currently mixing pretty much all of it into something one i suppose um but you started a, a little bit of that entrepreneurship by um during tra during traveling you want, you did a bit of food journalism currently still going and now doing several things how did you decide on what those things were that you wanted to do and how did you see the combination of your skills and interests you know i i'll kind of touch upon and what you were just asking the other panelists a little bit as well i think that maybe my experience was not as um as rosy as as the others are talking about, I think that early on in my career there was um, there was a lot of sexual harassment. There was a lot of um, drug use and alcohol abuse in some of the kitchens that I worked at, and it was something that I didn't want to focus on. I felt like I could be strong enough to go through this, you know, this phase of it and come out the other side. And as you know towards the end of my career, I was frankly, I was getting really burnt out. I was working six, seven days a week, um, you know, way too much and it had taken over everything. And so I decided to stop and I passed my restaurant onto, um, onto another chef and I sold all my stuff and um, I left the country and I was really chasing um, inspiration and, you know, like everyone else says, it's hard to be in that environment if you don't love it. And I realized that I wasn't really loving it anymore, that I was, um, and I needed to fix that. So I went around to try and find different chefs and different cuisines around the world. And that kind of led me to into the food journalism where I realized that um, you know, I was talking to other female chefs. This was, I left right about when the Me Too movement was starting to hit some of the famous um, chefs in the industry. And I was talking to other sh female chefs in California that I had worked with and, and started to document their experiences. And I really wanted to hear what other women were talking about around the world. Was this an American issue? Uh, was this just a Western issue? Um, 
And so I, I set off to interview as many chefs as I could, um, female chefs, um, from the people that ran the empanada stands to the fine dining restaurants um, across South America and um, and in, in Asia. And just started really getting some, some interesting perspectives. And it also kind of brought me back around that there are, there are different ways that we can give a voice and that there are, as Jane said, it's really important to pick the right, the right team that you want to work with. And I think in the beginning of at least my career, no one said it's okay to interview the restaurant as well. They said, this is a great restaurant. It's going to look great on your resume. Whatever happens there is what happens there. And if you don't like it, pack your knives and go. And as I hope, as we're kind of evolving in all industries, but especially the food and beverage and the hospitality industry, it's, it, it is important to work in a healthy environment. Not every environment needs to be toxic. And just because you are working in a kitchen does not mean that it should be abusive in any way. And I think that, um, you know, that we should interview kitchens as much as, as they interview us and finding of if you find a place that you're working in is toxic in any way, I think that you should call that out and you should leave. And so that kind of, that's what I've been doing with the journalism is just documenting other women's stories, some really great ones as well. You know, it, it's, this is not all negative by any means. I think there are just pockets of, of times when, um, hmm. when things are not as rosy. So I, I kind of did that. And then um, I really care about the environment. And I think that the food industry, most of the people in the food industry, chefs and, and suppliers, they care about the environment too. They care about how the food is produced and where it comes from. And it's all very circular. Um, and that's what I focus on now is uh, everything is very connected and very circular. And maybe we just don't always see it. So I'm trying to connect people with different suppliers in their communities and, and through this COVID where hotels and tourism companies are struggling it's uh it's been it's been great to try and connect them with other people that are more like kind of on a micro local level to um to kind of strengthen the community and help us rebuild the industry in a mm -hmm. in a stronger way and in a more holistic way um and I, that's that's I don't that's a Sorry, brilliant. That's a unpack, isn't no, it? <laughs> I know. I was like, what do I even what do I even get into? Um, as, that's a great way to um, I guess showcase that it it's okay to struggle and it's okay to feel lost and having to figure things out further down the line. Um, the the audience that follows me on Savi Hotelier is very young and they're feeling lost already because they don't know what's next. What's the five ten year plan? Um, while I keep trying to tell them that you're gonna in five, ten years time gonna still have those questions. It's just that you'll have more experience to uh, figure things out. And it's just part of life. Essentially, you will change your mind, you will have different experiences and you'll have to um, adjust. And whether you get a new interest and you want to combine that with your current background, um, that is there's so many ways to do that, whether that's writing, whether that's creating your own business or even just doing something on the side um just because you enjoy it um i think that's an interesting yeah. one and um speaking of team as well you pointed that out um, in terms of creating a culture and environment and having that connection with the people you work with um angelo you run a huge team um can you tell us a little bit more about how you create that culture how do you recruit people um to make sure that there is a positive working environment in such a big place as well well, you have to find a way to communicate with them because, of course, when you have a big team, uh, it's, it's different. I mean, uh, uh, you cannot uh, get all them together in a meeting room each week. I mean, uh, our team is 130 people, so it will be uh, difficult to have all of them one, each week uh, to, to speak with them. So uh, you need, of course, to count as well on the supervisor position, on the restaurant manager position, banquet manager position, in order to, to get to them. And uh, then is as well... Uh, um, we have a lot of technology today to communicate. So WhatsApp, group WhatsApp, and uh, as well bulletin that you can send to them. It's a good way to to communicate and to, to inspire them. For example, I remember that uh, when I got uh, the, the, the first year on this property, I was uh, always here. Yes, because we don't invest in equipment. We don't invest in equipment. So when we started to invest, what we did was a sort of uh, 
journal saying uh, each month how much we spend in investment in equipment. And of course, uh, spreading the knowledge between the team, they were a little bit more motivating seeing that we were actually investing uh, money on, uh, on uh, upgrading the, the property. And then of course there is the, um, the politic of the open door. I mean, uh, I, really, I really love when somebody of the team is coming to my office to address a problem or maybe to address a, a, personal, uh, um, a personal issue or personal opportunity to grow. I mean, in this case, for example, uh, we established as well a policy to uh, spend some of our budget money in uh, personal training. And I really love when somebody of them is coming with uh, their proposal and uh, inspiring me and uh, as well motivating why they need this kind of training. And of course, it starts as well from, uh, from uh, the hiring process. Usually, uh, our team, since the hotel was open in uh, 1992, uh, is pretty senior. So I'm uh, usually I'm trying to balance the seniority of the, of the team, integrated as well some people who are not so senior in the position. So to bring some, uh, let's say, fresh blood in the, in the team as well. Uh, and then it depends, of course, on the position that I'm, I'm looking, uh, looking for. And uh, usually, we, I look for people who are interested in the position. So I, what I really uh, look in an interview is uh, uh, that uh, this, per this, this person was uh, already um, searching about the company, searching about our uh, food and beverage offer. So I want a person who is interested in uh, the culture of the, um, of the hotel, as well in the culture of the gastronomic culture of the F&B offer. Interesting as well in growing. I really like people that are there to grow and to, to, to leave the sign that they were there. And how can you see that on uh, a CV when you're um, recruiting? Is there something you're looking for particularly? Well, it's uh, difficult to see it on the CV. Um, in the CV, maybe you can see some uh, um, skill which are related to the job. Uh, you can uh, um, usually in the CV, you can see if maybe they were changing uh, uh, many times the job, maybe they are not pretty sure about the space that they want to do. You usually see this during during the interview. I mean, it's something that you can really address during the interview. And if you see that uh, they already did their own work, uh, I mean, for me, it's really a, a big step when they did the own work. And for me, own work is uh, studying what the company is doing. So I, re I really get frustrated, and almost nervous when I get a candidate in front of me. Uh, and you ask, uh, okay, what do you know about us? I say, I do not have time to do it. And you say, okay. And in this case, I mean, the interviews is already starting in a, in, a, in a bad way. And even if you are maybe a rock star, you already lose some points. Mm. Definitely come prepared to the interviews. Um, I've got, I've got to take a question to career side now. Um, if say I have about five years of experience in being a waitress, uh, which I did have uh, back a few years ago. Um, what can I do next? What are the opportunities for me? Is it progressing towards being restaurant manager or is it what other steps can I take? If I'm kind of just at the crossroads, I don't know what to do. Um, Jordan, do you wanna give your advice? Yeah, I mean, I guess if you've been at it five years, then you're pretty sure that that's, you know, a solid direction and you want to, you want to, you know, stay in that, stay in the field, really. Um, but I guess I would advise anyone with five years of experience to then say, well, what is it about it that they like doing? Um, you know, is it the culinary side? Is it the service side? Or is it or is it more the, 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 the corporate side of it and the development and, and concept side of it? Um, because that's what it was for me. I think I, you know, I was identified that I was very much a foodie, but but also identified that I wanted to have a bit more of a development role within within restaurants and bars. So so it's just understanding what it is that what it what it what it is that excites you about the industry, and then and then follow follow that path more is what I would advise. And I think, you know, when I was at IHG, um, you know, my my num I was a director of of, of F and B for lifestyle there. And my number two had five years experience when he came on and he was, you know, an F&B an F manager in a property, but then came corporate side. So you could jump into a role role like that. But but, but prior to that, as I say, I would, would advise people to understand what it is that, that, that floats their boat within the industry and what, and what, what ignites them and then, and then follow that path. And how can you find those different things? Is it that you need to get different experience in different properties or restaurants? Um, or do you think you can do that within more or less the same place? 
it's always easier to find the experience in your current in your current place if you can. Um, I mean, that's what I did. I diversified within the business that I was working in, so seconded into a different role uh, within the same company. It's always easier to move internally to get experience. Um, and, and yeah, those those corporate roles are a bit more few and far between. I'm not going to lie. Um, but whatever you can do to, to, to bolster that experience and, and to Angelo's point as well, some of that research that you can do and, and do it, you know, finding your own experience is really, really valuable and really sings through in an interview. If you're able to say that you've done this sort of extracurricular work to, to, to broaden your own experience, really, really, was really important. Mm, that's a really good point. Yeah. If you're really passionate, find some other ways to learn more about it. Um, I, think actually, I think that there's a couple other um, maybe unthought of career paths in this. I totally agree with what Jordan's saying is about there's, you know, a, it's always easier to kind of climb the tree that you're already in. Um, but I, I think that there, if, if there was a five-year waitress, you know, that's a lot of customer facing. That's a lot of sales experience right there. So there are some other avenues that I think of would be um, catering sales from the banquet side, that would be um, supply chain sales. Um, if you're able to go to a table and, and upsell them all of the appetizers and drinks, then you certainly might be able to go into another kitchen and sell this week's amazing heirloom tomatoes to another, uh, you know, to another chef. So I think there's, a, there's some, it's worth thinking outside of just the box or the tree that you're in. Um, and customer facing like a waitress might be after five years certainly shows the dedication and problem solving skills and um, customer relations that are all incredibly valuable in the sales side of, of restaurant equipment, of food, of, um, you know, there's a lot of really great niche products that are out there right now. Um, you know, there's, yeah, there's so many different options. Mm. Yeah, and think about it, um, the way what you're saying is think about it as a different side of the business, right? We often get stuck in the operation side of, I'm a waitress, um, what, what can I do more in within operations? But actually, like you said, tra transferable skills can be applied in so many different sides of the business of restaurant management, um, which is, you know, managing people, having negotiations mm -hmm. and conversations and such. And that's what um, I think a lot of people need to work to really look at right now in, in this kind of pandemic time where an unprecedented number of food and beverage uh, professionals have been hit extremely hard by this. It's looking at, okay, what are the transferable skills that you have from your past jobs and what other avenues might those be applicable in? Mm. Yeah, you're not, no one is just a waitress. No one is just a bartender. No one is just a prep cook. That's yeah. I mean, they are incredible. They are incredibly transferable skills, right? That's that's the key, and that, I think that's what really taught me that, that those those skills can be applied across a plethora of other roles. The the, the next challenge is to find a way to communicate that on your resume, which is a skill mm. of its own, um, which I think, unfortunately. We, I wasn't taught at university, and hopefully, um, you know, we can find res more resources nowadays. But that is the next step. Um, and looking at the kitchen side of of this question, Jane, um, what can one do with five, ten years of FMB experience from the kitchen if they've so become an executive chef or quite senior, but again, don't know what to do next? Um, you had an opportunity to go to sort of a corporate uh, kitchen role. What else could one <laughs> yeah you know there's just stacks of opportunities now and I think that you know um, if you only look on social media to see the different routes that people take nowadays um, you know most groups so that's hotels or restaurants have development chefs development teams um, so there's you know there is always that side of things um, there's also, you know, retail product development. I mean, you know, all the fantastic products that you see on the shelf in Marks and Spencers and Waitrose and, you know, they, they don't just appear there. That's a whole, t that's a whole food team um, with real food background knowledge that have actually developed them. Um, so, you know, that's, and that's a massively um, growing sort of trend now. Um, there's, you know, there's, there's all sorts. It, every equipment supplier, so, you know, someone that manufactures ovens or 
um, stove tops. They've all got development teams that, you know, develop dishes and actually help people out there in the industry use their equipment. Um, but, you know, it's, you all need a chef background for all these kind of things. Um, food buying procurement is obviously, um, you know, a real popular avenue for people to go into. I think, you know, the, the important thing is, is to, to build your career and to get the experience and the knowledge. And then you can go in any direction. You know, I mean, how many chefs now have gone from, you know, a traditional hotel background or a traditional restaurant background and they've gone out and they've bought a, you know, a funky looking truck and they put a, a pizza oven on the back of it and they're just having a, a great time, you know, um, and everyone loves it. They make good money uh, and, you know, the destiny is theirs. So I think the, opp the opportunities are, are just absolutely massive. Mm. And, and more more you know you know about things more now all the all the social media and you know linkedin and you see what people are doing and it, it's just uh, i think it, it's so much more accessible for everybody mm. one role that i didn't even know existed until i stumbled upon it i think working with you jane um is a food stylist <laughs> um, I was like, wow, you can do that. <laughs> uh, so I think, and um, yeah. most food starters have chef backgrounds, experiences. They may not have 10 years of it, but they must understand yeah. how to prep food quickly and make it look good. And that's yeah, super important for photography. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm and, wondering. You know, that, again, it, it's a massive thing, but, you know, uh, counting baked beans out one by one was never something that I wanted to particularly do but you know it's it's a channel that's very popular yeah that's super and, and I think it's also um it seems fancy it is also not the easiest job out there but it is very interesting that's for sure you get to style food for taking really good pictures to then be con sold to consumers and it that's, sounds that's more glamorous it. than it is <laughs> exactly. but it, it's really interesting though it is I think that's a really great point, Jordan, is, uh, you know, there was this shift of, you know, as, as Jane said, it wasn't a glamorous job when she started out. And then when I went to school, it was like, oh, we're all going to be, we're all going to be rock stars. It's, no, you're not going to be a rock star. It's still a job. Any of these jobs are still a job. You're still going to have to show up on time. You're still going to have to work hard. You're still going to have to be accountable for the end result and the products that you promise to, to put out. So. Uh, I think that that's something that that younger people as they're going into the career should really keep in mind is with social media and these photography gigs, you know, it all looks very glamorous, but at the end of the day, it is still work. And, um, you know, no job is quote unquote easy. It's, it's otherwise it'd be called paid fun time, right? It, it's, uh, <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. You do have to enjoy what you do, though, um, to some extent, for sure. Um, well, we've we've already gone to forty five minutes mark. That's incredible. I, I have no idea where the time went, but we still have a few couple of questions to um, before we wrap up. And um, I want to take a step, I guess, and look at more generic um, picture as well in terms of. Someone currently in the industry, obviously, people have taken step, steps to the side, you know, people have developed their own businesses, they've had to figure things out because they've, their restaurant is closed or they've lost their job or whatever reason that um, their life has changed. Um, if, you're, if you're looking at someone who is not much experience, who is a student who may have had a part-time job here and there, doesn't, is not quite 100% sure about really what they want to do, but is interested in F and B. Um, what can they do now, um, Angelo? Maybe you can start with answering this. So, what can they do in terms of keep learning, developing themselves, or finding a hobby? Maybe is more. Um, I'm looking for more of a practical, tactical advice they can do today. I mean, first, there's nothing wrong in uh, doing something else which is not F and B. So, if you have the opportunity to work in another industry at the moment, please. Uh, Take the opportunity because, of course, uh, when to live uh, working, you know, I mean, if you don't work, you cannot live. And uh, actually, as well, from this experience, you can uh, catch as well ideas that you can benchmark and bring to the F&B business when you are uh, back in the hospitality industry. And I think that uh, during this pandemic, uh, we had a lot of opportunity to, to learn. And I think that uh, this is uh, um, really the, the biggest opportunity that we have at the moment. I mean, uh, still uh, 
learning, learning, and learning, and uh, uh, let's get prepared when the business is back to on track. And uh, uh, at the moment, I can say that I see uh, three big uh, um, area where I think that in the future we will need uh, some really good skilled people. And uh, one, of course, is technology, and, uh, and maybe study something which is uh, related to FMB world and technology, which is not just digital ordering. There are a lot of other processes in uh, the FMB world which could be, for example, optimized, like for example, procurement, like for example, training, and uh, and so on. Another field, for example, that I think that it's uh, good to upskill at the moment is the sustainability. I mean, Victoria, of course, uh, has uh, better to say on, uh, on on this field that I I can, but I see as well the um, let's say the combination of technology and sustainability that could work together. For example, here in Barcelona, two weeks ago, um, uh, a really important cocktail bar developed a coaster, which is made by uh, coffee grounds, and it was made by a food tech company. So actually, they're using the coffee grounds, they re recycle the, food, the coffee grounds to use them back as coaster. So it's something that uh, you can upskill and you can uh, learn a little bit more and to be ready when the market is back. And then I see a lot of attention uh, from FMB um, management point in uh, revenue management. I mean, we saw in the hospitality world a lot of uh, revenue management in the uh, room division, and they are doing great. Even if they are doing at the moment, of course, due to the pandemic, uh, they are in challenge and uh, all the forecasts and all of the historical data maybe at the moment, they are not so trustful as they were in the past, but there are a lot of technical revenue management which are uh, underused uh, in, uh, in FMB. And I think that uh, all these three fields are fields where we can uh, invest more in, uh, in skills in the future. And we are looking for people who can help us to develop the FMB experience better as well as maybe upskilling in the, the area that I was talking about. I think that's um, an interesting, unusual almost um, tips in a way. It's not just go upskill and whatever, but here's um, a side of the business you haven't thought about before. Um, so I think that's, that's super interesting. Thank you for sharing that, Angelo. Um, okay, um, what is your favorite thing about working in the FMB sector, about your current job? Um, I want everyone to answer it. Shall we go around and um, starting with Victoria? Ooh, well, uh, I guess uh, right now I get a lot of joy out of um, helping businesses in, in the city that I'm in that are really small cafes that have never really thought about sustainability, connecting them with the farmers that are just 20 kilometers away and um, kind of teaching them a little bit of how to use uh, the digital space so that they can um, you know, a lot of the restaurants here have uh, menus written on butcher paper with a Sharpie. So it, there's just so much that you can teach some of this older generation of food and beverage here that is really impactful and that feels great. And um, and also just helping them to learn about the sustainable practices that are available, water management and, and you know, waste management with, with food waste. There's really little low low hanging fruit that we can grab at that makes a big difference. Jordan, um, well, I think food and drink is really the sexy end of hospitality, isn't it? Especially <laughs> with restaurants and bars specifically. Um, I think you know back in my back in my time in operations in hotels, I was always trying to be convinced to go into hotel management or, or GM GM roles, but it just didn't really appeal to me. I think. You know, restaurants and bars is, is, is where the fun is. Um, and I think importantly for me, it's where the creativity lies in that part of the business. There's lots more avenues to, 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 to create something far more unique uh, in those spaces. So it, it's really the creativity that gets me up in the morning, uh, day in, day out. That's, that's, that's what I love. That's, that's where I'm passionate about with this, for sure. Amazing. Um, Jane? Well, for me, I just love the fact that, you know, every every day is different. Um, I do a lot of different uh, things for different people. So one day I can be in a kitchen all day. Uh, the next day I might be um, at my desk writing a menu, looking for new suppliers, um, you know, or seeing a, a concept through from um, just a, an idea on a piece of paper right through to opening and actually, you know, what I call making it happen. 
Um, but I think for me, the, the biggest thing that I enjoy is um, working with the teams and seeing how I can help them become confident in, in what they're doing. Uh, I've worked with some teams that, you know, aren't skilled at all. Um, and, I, you know, I go in and I ask them to, to do something and it, clearly they have no idea how to how to do that. Um, and how to become confident so you know by actually working alongside someone and you know showing them the the good and the efficient ways of doing things um, and then at the end of it they're you know a confident employee um, you know for me that's that's what um, that's what it's all about. And Angela? I will take the lead from Jordan from the creativity because I think that uh, uh, them most important aspect for me is creating experience, but in difference of the room department, where you create, for example, a good setup of the room, you cannot realize the reaction of the guest because the guest is uh, alone in the room. In FMB, when you're creating a big experience for the guest, the guest is in front of you. So you, you can feel the emotion because the emotion is just in front of you. If you do a nice setup with roses and so on for uh, maybe an engagement, you will uh, leave the experience with the guest uh, himself. So for me, this one is one of the most uh, most important aspect and uh, um, the second uh, aspect of course is related to uh, the team uh, the team engagement I mean uh, to let the people grow with you for me is one of the most important aspects that they have in uh, my current career and to grow together with them I think it's uh, it's it's really important yeah um, I definitely think that if anyone who's listening is not sure but loves the industry but not sure what's happening next definitely stick around don't give up on hospitality just because we are uh, very strongly impacted by by the pandemic definitely find a way to still be in it whether that not be your full-time job but in some in some shape or form if it is your passion there are so many different ways you can share it you can engage with it um and there's so many ways like we just we, we just um you know had all of these examples of things you can do and ways you can express yourself um and whether that's connecting with people create being creative or um helping people teach them something new help them realize their potential um so many different ways to go around so um any last words from anyone before we wrap up i think um it's been a fantastic conversation i want to thank you all but if you want to leave any last words of wisdom you know i think i'll, I'll just point out that right now the eu has an incredible amount of money that's available for new sustainable circular um uh, projects, whether that be in the tourism industry or in research and development. So uh, if you have a great idea, like turning coffee grounds into a coaster or, you know, making glassware out of recycling something else or finding a way to turn discarded, you know, dishware or, or furniture into something else that can be used or sold, um, it, or even a wackier idea. There are funds out there available that you could apply for and get grants and get funds to get those ideas off the ground um, from the EU Green Council. So I would definitely look into that. And, and if you have time to be researching and learning on something, you know, versing yourself on, on what those processes are to get your hands on some of that money so that you can launch something that might make a huge difference for the future in in all of our industries go get that money <laughs> <laughs> and i think i think we obviously you know most everyone that's in a fmb career at the minute is on hiatus and i think you know just just rest assured that certainly certainly in our company we're really preparing to be coming back in the summer bigger and better than we were before so Hang in there. It's tough at the minute, but yeah. it's going to be a great. It's going to be a great summer. Yeah, totally. Um, I, that's what I would say. Stick with it. Um, when when you're able to get back to work, work hard. Learn your industry. Learn everything there is about it. Um, the more knowledge you have, the the more you know. The more opportunities will be open to you. Um, but most importantly, enjoy the job and have fun. And I would like to add that uh, whatever is the opportunity, just uh, make sure to make the difference. Just uh, make sure to leave your sign, to leave your signature, that the people know who you are, and then the opportunity will come then by themselves. And great work never goes unnoticed. Right, completely <laughs> right.
Good. Well, thank you so very much for um, for your advice, for your recommendation, sharing your stories, um, your time. Most importantly, thank you so much for volunteering your time to be part of this panel and conversation. Um, this was uh, the sixth episode of Discover Hospitality series. Um, next week, we're talking about hotel openings. Um, so very a niche area of the hotel business, uh, but something as well to think about. Um, we already discussed within the restaurant business, there's people who open. And similarly, within hotels, there's people who open as well. Um, so join us next week as well on Thursday. And thank you so very much for your time and have a fantastic evening, morning, day, wherever you are. Thanks so much. It's been a pleasure thank to talk you. with all of you. Thank you. Bye.